My name is Joshua Jip. I teach New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and the book that I authored is called Reading Acts in the Cascade Companion series. At its core, the book of Acts is all about God. God is the major character throughout the book of Acts that basically brings into existence uh, a community of people who worship and follow Jesus of Nazareth. This is Luke's second volume. He also wrote uh, his gospel, the Gospel of Luke. And so in the book of Acts, what he's primarily trying to do is to tell the foundation story about how God brought this movement into an existence and also how these worshipers of Jesus are continuing the story that he told in his first volume in the Gospel of Luke. The book of Acts is also um, an incredible resource for just learning about the ancient world. Um, it's entertaining and edifying. Um, the reader of the book of Acts will go on a tour of the ancient world. Uh, they'll begin in Jerusalem and engage in the Jerusalem temple. Uh, they'll see new people, different peoples such as Samaritans and eunuchs and Roman military people. They'll travel to uh, the famous uh, Athenian Areopagus. They'll go to the temple in Artemis. They'll encounter uh, all kinds of interesting stories about prison escapes and shipwrecks and encounters with exotic uh, people. Um, and so the book of Acts is telling the story about God, but it's doing so in a way that is entertaining and enjoyable as well. One misconception about the book of Acts is that it, it, it sets forth sort of a missionary manual for how to do missionary activity. Now, on the one hand, I don't want to be too hard on this misperception because on the one hand, um, at its heart, the book of Acts is certainly about mission. Um, from beginning to end, all of these characters are taking the message about Jesus of Nazareth um, from the beginning uh, in Jerusalem all throughout the known ancient world. And so mission, if you were to take that out of the book of Acts, it would unravel. It wouldn't work anymore. The plot would just entirely self-destruct. But I don't think we're supposed to read it as though it's necessarily prescriptive now for how we do missionary activity in sort of a literalistic kind of way. Um, and so some of the models that might be developed in terms of uh, how to do missionary activity as if it's a handbook, sometimes that can stretch the book of Acts in a way that I think probably the author didn't intend. That doesn't mean that the book of Acts isn't intended to still give all Christians of all ages, all centuries, um, some of the foundational DNA for what the church is about, what its foundational practices are. But this is going to take a little bit more um, work to interpret what that looks like in our day and not just sort of a simple kind of like cut and paste from 2,000 years ago into the 21st century North American context. There are so many great themes in the book of Acts uh, uh, to choose from. So many entertaining themes, so many powerful themes. I think if I had to choose one, perhaps my favorite theme in the book of Acts is the element of surprise. Um, and this really flows from the fact that God is the author of this movement. So in the very beginning, um, the disciples, uh, they're meeting with the resurrected Jesus and they ask him the question, is now the time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Uh, to us, and, and uh, Jesus says to them, um, uh, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that my Father himself has appointed, and instead you'll receive the Holy Spirit. Um, in other words, God is the one it's, that is going to be determining the times and the seasons and how this all gets worked out. And this is not going to be something that humans are able to manipulate or sort of manufacture on their own. And so you often see God acting and the human characters trying to catch up or even discern to who God is and what he's doing in ways that are challenging and surprising to them. So one stretch of text where you see this element of surprise in a powerful way is um, through chapters 8 through 10. And I'll just take you through those quickly. Chapter 8, you get the gospel moving from Jerusalem to their enemies, the hated Samaritans. So much so that the Jerusalem apostles have to come down from Jerusalem to Samaria to say, have they really received the gospel? And this is where they lay their hands on them and they receive the Spirit. To us, whatever, another some group of people receiving the gospel. But for that day and age, this would speak into sort of the rift between J Jerusalem and Samaria. Uh, and in many ways was saying like, the gospel is also going to our enemies. 
The next character you get is an Ethiopian eunuch, um, someone who is a sexually ambiguous um, uh, individual who had been on his way to worship God at the Jerusalem temple, but may not have been successful because we know um, from the Old Testament and other Jewish texts that eunuchs were not allowed to enter into and were often cut off from the assembly of the uh, people of God. So the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch then is the one that's reading Isaiah. Philip, the early Christian, encounters him, says, do you know what you're reading? How can I, he says, unless someone explains it to me. Philip explains it to him and uh, the eunuch says, what can prevent me now from being baptized? Chapter 9 is probably the most fam one of the most famous scenes, but I'll just quickly say um, we probably shouldn't think of this as the conversion of Saul or the conversion of Paul. Saul is more along the lines of a violent activist terrorizing the early Christian community. He's an enemy of the risen Christ, and he, of course, encounters the risen Messiah and becomes his star witness throughout the rest of the book of Acts. And then maybe my favorite, um, Cornelius, a Roman military man, sympathetic to, uh, certainly sympathetic to the God of Israel, but inherently involved in idolatry because of being a Roman military man, has a vision. And Peter, the premier apostle in the first part of the book of Acts, has a simultaneous vision as well. To make a long story short, God is the one that brings these two characters together such that Peter enters into this pagan man's home saying, you know, it's impermissible. I really shouldn't be here. It's sort of taboo. Why have you sent for me to be here in this pagan Roman military household and space? Um, what ends up happening uh, is Peter gives a speech. The Spirit of God comes upon these Gentile, uh, Gentile characters, and they themselves uh, become now part of the early Christian movement, opening up the door for the gospel to go to throughout the, uh, um, the ancient known world. So the element of surprise and the way, what it tells us in terms of how God is the one that's directing the story and really requiring that humans are listening, paying attention, discerning, uh, getting over some of their stigmas and cultural conventions. That's probably one of, if not maybe my favorite theme in the book of Acts. I mean, I think there are a lot of good reasons to read the book of Acts. I've mentioned a couple already. Um, it's really entertaining. So if you want an interesting two to three hour read, um, I, I think most people could pick it up and sort of just enjoy the entertainment of the book. And it's also an amazing text for learning about the first century or learning about the ancient world. See all kinds of different customs, practices uh, about this early Jewish Christian movement. And so anybody that's interested in ancient history, I would say this is a certainly a worthwhile book to read. But I do think that most people that read Acts are probably going to be reading it because they believe that it's Christian scripture and they want to know God and they want to know how they're supposed to live their lives. And the fact that Luke has provided a narrative here for us can make that a little bit challenging. How do you obey a narrative? Let me just say that the narrative that Acts constructs for us is one that is inherently self-involving. As you are reading that story, you are like Peter or like Cornelius or Paul or the other characters. You're entering into it, um, into the same drama, into the plot, questioning with Peter, should I really go to the house of Cornelius or should I not? And so there's a sense in which you're even encountering God, um, if you are a Christian that believes this is a revelatory text, as you simply participate in, uh, in an active way in reading the narrative. Now, I don't think this means that we can just move in a very facile or easy way or that this is the best way uh, from sort of the text says this, therefore 2,000 years later, prescriptive, we must do this in sort of the exact same way. But it does give us some of the enduring, um, enduring practices, uh, enduring principles, enduring aspects of the identity of the church that I would say any church 21st century, 17th, beyond whatever, um, should be listening to and paying attention to. I'll give you a couple of examples. The book of Acts makes it clear that the church uh, originates out of God's election of his people Israel.
In other words, there is no sort of the church replaces Judaism or God rejects his people Israel. Any kind of supersessionist sort of like God's done with Israel has no hope for them. The book of Acts gives us sort of an enduring testimony that that's problematic and that has problematic theological consequences as well. The book of Acts also gives to us what are some of the enduring practices of the church. For example, uh, any church that believes Acts is Christian scripture um, should probably be asking questions along the lines of, in what ways are we embodying hospitality, like the first century church did, to strangers? In what ways are we not defining ourselves and our, uh, our group of believers by simple social conventions? Is there any element of surprise in terms of who continues to worship with us? Uh, the practice of the community basically being a community of friends, um, sharing their possessions, caring for one another, um, visiting those who uh, are in need. Uh, is that something that's still uh, uh, evident in our churches today? Some of these sort of enduring practices that you see in the book of Acts, I would argue we can look at and continue to ask the questions, in what ways are we sort of continuing the story of Acts in our own church life? Thank you.